So there's this Bible verse about the beach. And since our church is in a city with beach in its name, we should probably know what the scripture says about this beautiful place where the ocean meets the land. by the beach, even if you don't have beach in the name of your city. Just ask any of our friends from Texas or Idaho or Kansas. We all live by the beach, everybody. When you go to the beach, what do people go there for? The waves. That's what they go there for. Little kids running away from them. Then eventually you're boogie boarding in them. Maybe you're surfing on them, watching the dolphins swim in the waves. That's what everybody wants to see is the waves. So we got up early this morning. And before sunrise, I was here at the Wedge, one of the most famous waves around here in Southern California. And you can just right away, you hear the boom, you hear the thunder of the water smacking up against the shore. And you just hear this low rumbling sound and then you see it kind of swell back and then it just crashes onto the sand. And see, the Bible's gonna teach you something right now. It's gonna tell you that the most impressive thing about the beach it's not the waves, it's the shore. This is what Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22 says. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. So we're so focused on the epic rise and fall of the water that we don't even notice that every time you come to the beach, the power of the shore is more. It's still there. And look at the waves rising. Look at them tossing. But look at how God has decreed the boundary of the sea and it cannot cross. Though it tries with all of its might to encroach on the shore, God's power is more. And so next time you go to the beach, Take a moment from looking at the waves and realize what you're standing on. You're standing on something that cannot be tossed around, that cannot be moved, that the sand is the boundary of the sea. That's the Bible verse about the beach. And it comes in today's chapter, Jeremiah 5. Now, I don't know if you've ever read this chapter before, but it's one of the most chilling chapters of judgment that I've read in the scripture. And it starts by saying, run to and fro in Jerusalem. Like run around the city and see if you can find one righteous person. And the implication is you won't be able to find one righteous person in the whole city of Jerusalem. Is there one who does justice? One who seeks truth? Like God's saying, I'll spare the whole city if you can find one guy, one man, one woman who's about justice and you can't even find him. It, it, it immediately makes you think about Genesis 18 when Abraham is praying for the city of Sodom and he starts, God, spare it if there's 50 righteous and he keeps working it down. If there's just 10 righteous, will you spare the city? And there was only one righteous man in the city of Sodom, Lot, and God rescued him out of that city before it was destroyed. Well, the idea here is in Jerusalem, the city where God put his name, put his temple, the city of God's people. You can't even find one person who seeks truth in God's city. What could have happened? Well, one of the things it says in Jeremiah 5, it says in verse 8, I mean, this is a graphic uh, description of sin. It says that the people were well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. So one of the issues that gets addressed big time here in Jeremiah 5 is lust, sexual immorality. And I remember, I'll never forget this sermon I heard when I was in college. It was at the time of the, the scandal between Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, and I heard a preacher go off on Jeremiah 5 about the lying, about the deceit, saying, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, and just how the sin was becoming more and more accepted in America. Wow, that seems like the problems with Bill Clinton 
they don't seem like they were that bad of problems compared to what's going on in America today. And here's what God thinks. When sexual morality becomes rampant, common, when it becomes just the way people live, when people make casual statements in culture about sex outside of marriage, about pornography, about homosexuality, all of these things, God says, shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? So we gotta look at it from God's perspective. God is the judge. And so when God sees, when God designed marriage, and he designed it between a man and then he made woman to be his perfect companion, his suitable helper, and they're supposed to, the two come together as one, and that's God's design for the union of, of marriage. And then he just sees it being perverted and twisted and taken out of context. If you're God, what are you supposed to do about that? Are you just supposed to be okay with it? Are you supposed to let it go? Or would you say, as God says here today in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 9, shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? See, we're so busy looking at the waves that, that rise up and, and fall and the tossings and the roarings. Maybe we need to realize that we should fear God. We should tremble at his judgment. The power of his shore is more. Maybe our eyes are on the wrong things and we need to realize, wow, God has designed life to be a certain way. And if we go against God's design, we invite his judgment. At the end of Jeremiah 5, God says this, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesied falsely, and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? And so the point of this chapter is to make us appalled, to make us think that something horrible is happening. Prophets are supposed to speak for God. They're supposed to be filled with the Spirit and speak words of truth, and they're saying whatever they want. They're saying what people want to hear. And the priests, priests who are supposed to follow the commands of God to bring people into the presence of God, the priests are making up their own way to go. They're doing it however they think is best. And the people, what do the people think about false prophets and, and out of control rogue priests? The people applaud it. The people cheer it, they love it. And then there's this chilling question. So what will you do when the end comes? If Jeremiah 5 comes off harsh to you, I just want to remind you that we started reading through the Hebrew Bible together at the beginning of coronavirus. Like you can go back and you can see when scripture of the day strikes back, we were in Deuteronomy. And we have read Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, and now we're in Jeremiah. And yeah, when Joshua was leading the people, they were good. Sometimes with David, they were good. But most of the time, people have been sinning now for, for decades, for generations. What will you do when the end comes? Because the end is coming. There is going to be enough sin, and it will lead to judgment. you got to see it from God's perspective. He says, shall I, again, shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? And so I want to strongly encourage you today with a very sobering chapter of Scripture. Please don't get caught up in the rise and fall of sin. Don't listen to the sound of its roar. Don't get looking at all the worthless things that we can see on our screens. Will you remember today that life is not about what you can look at or see or hear, but the power of the shore is more? That God who has spoken in truth is going to judge people according to what we have done. And we want to stand on the solid rock of God and who he is and not get tossed to and fro by the waves. And so the question that God has for you today, and I hope you'll really think this through, is do you not fear me, says the Lord? Do you not tremble? Don't you go to the beach and see that no matter what those waves do, I set the sand as a perpetual 
boundary, no matter what is happening in the world today, God will judge and make things right. All of the sin will not change the absolute standard of God's righteousness. And so what will you do when the end comes?